Welcome to The Big Debate. I'm Ridi Tlabi. Local government elections are on the 1st of November. Political parties are out in full force, handing out T-shirts and showering voters with promises and excuses. Building better communities together, says the ANC. While the DA claims a record of action and a promise of more. If you vote EFF, you will get land and jobs, manji. The UDM commits to putting people first. That's what's on the menu. Will voters take a bite or have we had enough of this diet? More specifically, can the ANC convince us that it's more concerned about our welfare than its own enrichment? Is the DA in self-destruct mode after bringing in black leaders and then failing to retain them? Will the EFF sustain its growth or has it reached its limit, now descending into populism? Who has the vision to improve the quality of life where each of us lives? Joining me are Pumulo Masuale, ANC Governance Committee Chairperson and Deputy Minister of Public Enterprises. We also have Gwen Nguenya, Head of Policy for the Democratic Alliance. Andile Jabavu, Gauteng Chairperson of the UDM's Youth Vanguard. And Tessa Duems, Political Analyst and Academic. We invited the EFF, but they declined to come. In our virtual audience are South Africans from across the country. Welcome to all of you. And of course, welcome to you at home. You can join the conversation using the hashtag on your screen. OK, I just want to find out from the audience. Let's start with a quick poll. If you are planning to vote and you are enthusiastic, wave at me. OK, all right, I see you, I see you. And if you are not voting or you're not sure, OK, I see. It seems that many eligible voters are not convinced. We traveled around the country and this was a very common sentiment. I get happy to anything, you get no vote. Because I don't see anything, mm. any improvement. to <laughs> ANC nothing, DA nothing, COPE nothing, EFF nothing. Because Laban to Labo, Bonabayaza, Tina Sizi, Tina Slala Sangazang. You've heard from people who will not be voting. In fact, 13 million eligible voters didn't even register this time around. So let's hear from the parties themselves and see if they can persuade the undecided. Each party representative will have an initial 90 seconds to tell people why they should vote for you. Then, of course, I'll ask a follow-up question and give each of you another 30 seconds to answer. Let's start with Pumulo Masowele of the ANC. After 27 years, the moral and economic case for the ANC has taken some battering. How can you overcome your track record of corruption and, to put it politely, incomplete service delivery? There's great progress that's been made, albeit there are many challenges that still lie ahead of us. We've learned from the experiences uh, thus far, and we have since uh, taken a very firm view on the necessary changes that must be put in place so as to secure a better future for all the people. Uh, we've uh, improvised the way of identifying uh, candidates. We've also looked to the recruitment processes uh, for where we derive the skilled people to help uh, do the work. We've also looked at uh, synergies that must be there between uh, all the spheres of government to ensure that they work together collaboratively for the betterment of the lives of our people. We do appreciate uh, that the people are indeed uh, very saddened at the lack of, of delivery and the pace of it at times, but we do want to appeal to them to uh, vote for the ANC, for we are determined uh, to bring about the necessary changes. You almost sound like a party that's just starting and not a party that's been governing for 27 years. And there's another thing that comes across in your answer and in the ANC, that you talk about South Africa's problems as if you are observers, as if you're not a party in government. How do you do that? Bringing about change to our country is not just a function of a political party. It's a function of participation, where people themselves, as the recipients, are not just on lookers, are participants. Perhaps uh, our emphasis is working together with people, bringing about these changes with them. 
I'm going to challenge you on that in just a moment, but let's hear from the DA here, Gwen Nguenya of the DA. Herman Mashaba was a former DA mayor, and he once said that some members of the DA caucus in Johannesburg have suggested we prioritize the needs of suburban residents above providing dignity to those forgotten people. Mashaba was one of several prominent black leaders who've left the DA recently. How do you plan to overcome your reputation as a party that does not have space for black leaders and township residents? Our manifesto is about our record of action and a promise of more. We felt that many parties are going to come to this local election making promises, and we wanted to focus on really where we are indisputably strongest on our governance record. If you look at the financial management of DA municipalities, if you look at performance on service delivery indicators, and then as a result of those two things, if you look at the broader economic environment, the rates of unemployment and economic growth where the DA governs, we believe as a result of prudent financial management and sound performance um, on service delivery has been able to ensure those results. On the question that you ask, Herman Mashaba was the mayor. And as we all know in South Africa, mayors have extraordinary uh, powers to affect what happens in their particular region. So if certain suburbs ended up being served more than poor areas, that would have been on Mashaba's head, not anyone else in the DA. But generally, our record on the poor is also clear. Recently, we cited a Stats SA uh, report. It's called the Non-Financial Census of Municipalities. And it shows that if you look particularly in the Western Cape where we have the largest basket, municipalities in the Western Cape support a greater proportion of indigent households than municipalities in any other province. So I think our track record on the poor is very clear. It would be very weird if it suddenly differed in the city of Johannesburg. Timon Mashaba, not the only DA leader, black leader, who has stepped out of the party. Very prominent people like uh, Pumzile Van Dam. I can go back to the days of Pumzile Masibuko. And here I also want to talk about how the DA constantly says it is not a party that is focused on race, that you are not a prisoner of identity politics. And then you go and put up posters that shows that you are exactly that. Why are you not reckoning with this part of your identity? I want to address the issue of black DA members who you say have left the DA. Yes, there have been. But what I do find unfair really is that there are people of various racial groups, uh, male, female, different age groups who leave the party. And political parties have an extraordinary turnover anyway. The fact that we keep on producing leaders and going on demonstrates actually that the depth of the party. It's not based on one particular individual. Just on the DA's record, uh, you quoted a stats SA uh, a metric, but there were some challenges to that, that uh, when it comes to sanitation, things had improved indeed in the, in the Western Cape, but other metrics, things had not improved and also criticised for your response to poor and homeless people, particularly during COVID-19, where they were gathered up and they were arrested, not really um, responding with empathy to the reality on the ground. Firstly, that claim that the results that we are showing on indigent households is incorrect is not true because the person challenging it is citing a completely different report. I'm happy to, to supply the non-financial census of municipalities and show where the figures that we cite uh, come from. On, on homelessness, you know, the DA was during the COVID pandemic trying to ensure that people who are out in the streets didn't have access to water, which was key uh, during COVID, were taken to places of shelter. Now, you can either paint someone being offered alternative shelters as taking them away and removing them, or you can view it as providing somebody without shelters an opportunity to access accommodation. Let's hear from the UDM now. Andile Jabavu, your leader, Bantu Holomisa, had a significant following in the Eastern Cape. We all know that. And he was respected and still is for calling out the ANC on corruption over the years. And yet your support continues to dwindle. Why have you failed to build your base and why should we vote for you? We've got a huge problem of good leadership and uh, leadership with integrity here in South Africa. You can have a very good policy to get rid of crime, uh, but if you are going to put a, a corrupt criminal to implement that policy, that policy becomes null and void. That's what we have currently. We've got everything in place in as far as policies. We've got a huge problem of leadership 
who are more than willing to assist people. And as the UDM, that's what we're bringing to the people. However, the only problem that we, ha we are having in South Africa is that the political landscape is played on popularism. So that's what we are trying to change. Hence, we, we try and implement actions as opposed to trying to trend on social media. So that's what we are bringing as, as, as the UDM. All right, that's what you're promising. But I'm asking, after so many years, after Bantu Holomisa, your leader, broke away from the ANC, formed a party with Ruf Meir, there was a lot of excitement in South Africa, but your numbers are going down. Why are you failing to grow? If you don't have the funding, if you don't benefit from the corrupt uh, activities, uh, you, you, you don't get to attract the people. That's where the problem is. So as the UDM, obviously we are not corrupt, but uh, surprisingly enough, people are still following the same people who are corrupt that we are exposing. So I think that's where the problem lies. Tessa, I'd love to hear your insights here. How do you sum up the choices that we have as voters this time around? We have um, some of the bigger parties who are grappling with a lot of their internal um, organizational issues and how their brands have been represented in the last um, five to 10 years in society. A lot of issues around corruption, issues, for instance, in the, the DA around their leadership. And so we are seeing a lot of the campaigns that are supposed to be about bread and butter local governance issues that are about the parties trying to convince us about their stature in society. And so we're not getting to really talk about um, some of those core fundamental things. And I think what we're missing even more than just talking about those core fundamentals is new, innovative, exciting ideas around how governance can become more effective, become more responsive and become more participatory. What's missing is how they intend to work with communities. We've seen a decline in voting. There's always been lower voter turnout at local government elections than national elections. So we're anticipating quite low numbers, but that's not indicative of voters that are apathetic. That's indicative of voters that are starting to prize their vote more. You mentor a whole lot of young people when you're sitting in a room with them. Would you still encourage them to vote? I would encourage young people to participate in the voting process. I would encourage them to um, pay attention to what all the parties and independent candidates are putting forward. But the most important thing is to make an informed choice where you feel like you can actually hold those people to account. Um, I think young people are most interested in parties that they actually believe they can engage with after the vote, not only parties that excite them before the vote. Right. When we return, some questions from the voters don't go away. Welcome back to the big debate on the local government elections. In two weeks, South Africans go to the polls for the country's sixth municipal elections since the advent of democracy in 1994. We went around the country and asked people to share their most urgent questions for political parties. Here is what they had to say. My name is uh, Sarah Mota. I'm from Pomalanga province. I want to know if we vote for the ANC, are they going to stop corruption and allow people to grow food wherever they want to, in front of their houses, at the backyards? ANC, if it fails now, what about another election? What is it going to do for us? If we give them the second chance or third chance, what are they going to do for us? All right, Pumula, let me come to you. Those are questions for the ANC. We saw a case a couple of weeks ago where police arrested a man who was growing cabbage on his pavement. In this South Africa today, where there is an acute hunger crisis, we have heard from the ANC, Vugu Zenzele, yet when people, they get arrested for this kind of thing. And I must add, every election, we see your premiers and your mayors and your representatives opening one single tap for a community that has been waiting for a tap for decades. How do you justify that? I'd really like to start uh, by saying uh, that uh, corruption, we have identified it as the single most uh, impediment uh, to development and progress, particularly for the downtrodden in our country. And to that extent, uh, we have strengthened uh, all the instruments that fight corruption from detection, including uh, where such has been found, uh, the prosecutorial organs. You can see the role that is being played uh, by the SIU, the Hawks. All that arsenal has been uh, really uh, improved uh, as of the food uh, gardens. What happened uh, in Tswane was rather very deplorable. 
certainly it's one of the things that requires uh, that uh, the, the bylaws they are immediately attended to uh, to reflect the importance uh, of uh, 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 food security. Uh, you have referred uh, to uh, the issue of uh, the quality of the services that our people are getting. And seeing politicians, ANC politicians, going to cut a ribbon to open a road that falls apart after a couple. So, so you're as the ANC being more committed to the PR and the photo moment, posing in front of houses of poor people. That can't be right. Being with the people and amongst them all the time is an important element uh, of uh, political leadership because it means uh, identifying uh, continuously in an unceasing way with the objective uh, situation that people find themselves. Certainly the issues of quality of the work performed are beginning to enjoy very, very serious scrutiny. You can see there are now value for money audits that are performed and we've got to ensure consequences to those who a substandard work as of water. It is a scarce resource for the whole country. It is something that is being worked on. All right, let's hear more from our viewers and get more questions around how they see the elections this time around. Take a look at this. To the DA, would they ever be in a position to also understand, especially in a province and city that they run, that there are certain things that they can take, adv take advice even from their own opposition in having take place, especially changing the lives of people in Kailicha, Kukuletu Nyanga and Philippi, because I would love to see the streets of Kailicha being uh, taken care of as well as the streets of Rondobosh. To the DA, my question is not particularly new. We have seen the mass exodus of prominent black leaders who have been subsequently humiliated by the DA. We have seen utterances such as the posters that should come up in Phoenix recently, which seem all but intended to provoke anger on the part of the black population. With these instances in mind, is the DA even trying to make themselves an attractive alternative to the majority of citizens of this country? Thank you. Um, on that first question, that is the purpose of the recent um, you know, article that, that we were also referring to earlier is to address that misconception that, you know, whenever somebody says that the DA governs well, of which the, there's plenty record of, such as the recent um, state of local government barometer, which was presented to the Cocteau uh, Portfolio Committee in Parliament. So then the question always is, but that is only applies in wealthier areas. It is not in poorer areas. And that's effectively what that first gentleman was talking about. And that Stats SA report, I mean, is quite clear so, you know, there might be that perception, but it's just not true. In fact, not only is the DA servicing the poorest um, households um, where it governs, but it does so better than the other provinces. Where it comes from is from the sense of, of saying, well, look at Camps Bay, look at Rondebosch, and then look at Kailicha. So, I mean, that's not really um, a fair comparison. In every single province, you've got affluent or wealthy areas, and you've got poorer areas, which then are cross-subsidized by the wealthier areas. And the, the state of those uh, poorest areas depends on the rate that can be cross-subsidized, but also on the broader economic environment in the country. Those poorer areas are not going to suddenly transform into a camps bay when unemployment and economic growth are where they are at. But even though nationally the country is not doing well, the Western Cape still has the lowest recorded level of, of unemployment. Again, there we are doing the best in, in trying to address. The second member asked about black members who had left the DA. It is not true to say there is a mass exodus of black DA leaders. One only needs to look at the number of black DA leaders in, in, in parliament, across our provincial legislatures, to look at our mayors, to know that um, the handful that have been named today do not even represent a tiny fraction of the total black DA leader cohort. So I really contest that assertion. All right, let's just hear what the audience has to say. Tabelo, I believe you have uh, a, a question or a comment to make. We as a matter of general have made it very clear that it is time for the ANC to move aside. Uh, they've had enough time. It's an insult to African people, black living in township, to say that you are we want another chance. And also the fact that the ANC in Etiquini municipality, they had to fire a mayor as a result of corruption. There is a deep failure in the service delivery. People who are living in, in, in the shacks are living like pigs in the mud. Uh, we continue to suffer while the ANC is flashing around giving PSL teams 15 million recently. Uh, in the area where I live in Brighton, we don't even have toilets at, as we speak. 
So you see the priority here that um, you rather show that you have a, 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 so much money that is fresh around to soccer teams than to provide an essential service like uh, for people to go, go to go to the toilet. You've made your point, Pumla. That's for you, hey? That is for you. I mean, that whole idea of asking people for a second chance, even the president of the AMC has traversed different corners of South Africa asking for a second chance. That is a tacit admission that you have failed. We don't ask for second chances unless we've messed up, right? The amount of progress thus far recorded is uh, pale when one looks at things still to be done. And to that extent, we put ourselves before our people to say we know there are areas in which we did not do as much as we should have. I mean, we know that there is a stadium, if you want to call it that. We know that we've got catering uh, 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 invoices that get paid and we have the PPE corruption. So what I'm trying to get at here is that you're asking for a second chance while those things are still happening. They are not in the past. And you said earlier that you want to be seen amongst the people. That's why you take photos at poor people's houses. But it is a PR exercise because what we see is that you're not amongst the people. You're going there with your luxury cars in the dusty streets that were dusty five years ago and they'll still be dusty in five years when you go back there. Those issues that are ongoing, they are being tackled as we speak. Even the issue you're speaking to of a stadium, it is a matter that is receiving attention as we have seen, because certainly it is unacceptable that public finances are spent in that manner. Okay. As of the leader of Abasali Basemichondolo, certainly I regret he thinks like that. Working with us, there is a better opportunity to address the concerns he has expressed there. He's basing it on what he's experienced under uh, ANC leadership in the K in KZN. But let's hear from Henrietta. My question is to both DA and the ANC, when our poor is being arrested for being landless, being homeless, they get put through the, the court and justice system so quick. What is the DA and the ANC telling us as a people? How serious are you? about taking back the monies, the assets that has been stolen and spending it on our poor where it's supposed to be spent. We never see people being jailed. We never see corrupt money being get back and plowed back to our communities where it belongs. There have been some, you know, retrieving of money that was stolen, but I think that last point is important. It's not enough and it's not being plowed back to communities. Gwen, I'm going to give you this one because I suspect uh, she is talking about the DA councillor who's out on bail, but that she's top on the list in that particular municipality. So also not serious about fighting corruption when it comes to your own members. So that's absolutely not true. If we're talking about the same incident, she's not on the top of the list. I think she's 16th or something. And also it's an ongoing legal court case. Just depending on the evidence that is currently available at the moment, um, it may be that they can't yet make an adjudication and it would be unfair to presume her guilty until she's had her, her time in court. But certainly all the way up to even when we've had mayors, you know, we haven't shown any fear or favor in, um, in making sure that people who there is strong suspicion of wrongdoing or political meddling and procurement processes, et cetera, are dealt with regardless of the level. And I think what sometimes is happening here is really a false equivalency. In fact, before you even mentioned the example, I knew who you were going to raise. And that speaks to the fact that the DA cases are so far and few in between that whenever somebody wants to say that all the parties are just as corrupt, it's always the same one or two cases that they, that they bring up for the DA. And what a party cannot do is get guarantee that nobody will ever be corrupt or do something that is off book. But what they can say is that should that person be found to have been doing that, we will deal with them. Isn't the point here, Gwen, not that for every corrupt ANC person, there should be a corrupt DA person. The point here is that the DA has uh, claimed that anti-corruption is in its DNA. So you want to see the DA acting even on that one person. Even if she's number 16, she is on the list, shouldn't she have stepped aside or fired or suspended pending the outcome of her trial? Because you do, as the DA, constantly ask people to step aside even though the legal processes are not complete. Well, I think you have to be on the list to be eligible, but I think once uh, that legal process is done, I'm absolutely confident 
that um, she will not find herself in the council uh, should the legal process find her guilty. I'm saying that the DA cases are very, very few and far between. And where people can even think of them, there is a very clear evidence that we are doing something about this. This isn't a matter of years of cover up where there's some lengthy commission of inquiry. She is cooperating and the council is cooperating and the legal process is now underway. So I think even the fact that we are talking about a legal process that is underway puts us miles and beyond any comparable cases um, and elsewhere. If the DA says our track record is 99% clean, of course, you're going to find that 1%. All right. Is it Yanni who wants to speak? It's Janae. So I have a quick question just for all of the parties. So it's it's become well known in our country that going to any municipal building has become more of a punishment than a service. I need to know what is the actual plan? Who is going to restore service delivery to a level where it is a service and not a punishment for the average citizen who has to go there? What's the plan? Shall we start with the UDM? Because I know that the UDM has had experience of being in coalitions in Nelson Mandela Bay and so on, and uh, criticism as well that um, you were not as strident in speaking out against corruption while you were in that city. And also the fact that the quality of services in Nelson Mandela Bay regressed, that's certainly been some of the criticism. What do you say? We, we've got a huge problem of corruption and we've been, it to, to it's, 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 it's boring now because like everyone can see it. That's the reason why we are having these financial problems within the municipalities. But however, speaking of the Nelson Mandela Bay, uh, obviously we've had situations where our mayor was attacked, you know, or politi uh, political motives by certain political parties, but uh, they, they they didn't produce any report to actually incriminate him. Currently, we, we are having an acting mayor, Urukolo Namete, he's doing a very good job. So... I'm sure you you haven't had anything, you know, bad. No, but that was not the case in Nelson Mandela Bay. And I think that's what broke the DA and the UDM uh, cooperation there. And may his soul rest in peace. But you're talking about uh, the former mayor, Bobani. There was actually a report, and I've challenged your leader on it, on why he was not acting on it. So it does seem as if when, uh, you know, the finger was pointed at you, you were not able to rise to the occasion as the UDM. We've actually dealt with the situation internally, obviously, as the political party. But however, what we were clear about was that the judicial system must actually do its job. We are actually more than welcoming any report that seeks to incriminate the mayor. We never actually try to defend any corrupt activities in as far as counting how many people are corrupt. You know, we only have one corrupt member. As, as the UDM, we are transparent about the way we do things. If you've got anyone that is corrupt within the, the, the UDM, come forward and then we'll deal with, with, with that person internally and then let the law do its job. All right, when we return, we will discuss coalitions and backstabbing. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching The Big Debate. The ANC lost ground in major metros in the last local government elections in 2016, and we ended up with a hodgepodge of political parties entering into coalitions. Many of them did not end well. And whilst the politicians were trying to outmaneuver each other in council, community members like Vuyogazi in Nelson Mandela Bay suffered the consequences. <laughs> Tessa, let me bring you in here at political level people from partnerships, cooperation, coalitions. But at the end of it all, people like Viogazi are affected by this, I would call it poor leadership. What are your thoughts? When we have coalitions, it's because the electorate have said, we don't trust parties to govern by themselves. We've had a history of that. We've seen it. It has not worked. And now we are expecting parties to work in the interest of not their political parties and their political um, mandates, but to work in the interest of the people of the city, regardless of political um, affiliation. And we've seen um, over the last few years, unfortunately, that the parties are not rising to that challenge. All over the world, 
There are governments that are being formed around coalitions all the time, and those work because there's political maturity. And I think in South Africa, more of that is needed. And it, it speaks to other kinds of issues we have around the ways in which political parties are engaging the electorate. I mean, just questions about being honest about failure. Do you fess up as opposed to say, well, that's just an isolated incident, or you know, we, we're starting to address that now that it's been in the public domain. There needs to be a lot more humility and, and ability to admit wrong. And on the other side, also just inspiring people with new ideas. I mean, one of the, the audience members asked a very direct question that said, what is the new idea that you're going to put on the table that's going to move us towards service? And we're still getting kind of a setting the bar very low by political parties. We just need a different kind of political culture that aspires to more than um, where we are right now. Gwen, let me bring you in here. I mean, Tswani, Johannesburg, Nelson Mandela Bay. It seems that the DA was the weakest link in those coalitions that didn't work out. Have you learned anything from the coalition period? Well, if we didn't leave the coalition, then I'm not sure we're the weakest link. Um, you know, coalitions are a tough job. They're not easy. In response to what Tessa was talking about, I mean, I'm not aware of those numerous international examples that mostly work. The point is to say that there are many that equally don't work. I mean, we speak to counterparts in countries like Germany and others where they have a long history of governing and coalition. And all of them come back to us and say, you know, there's no silver bullet to these things. Um, what does assist them internationally is that their parties tend to be a lot closer on the political spectrum. And then secondly, of, of course, it, it also means that their coalition agreements are generally a lot more public. And I do think we need to start having a conversation around Either maybe we want to have a legislative framework that governs coalitions, that everyone is in the loop as to how exactly a coalition works, or when coalition partners or even minority governments come to some kind of agreement, it needs to be better articulated to voters. And maybe we might benefit from a longer um, coalition negotiation period, because currently there's like two weeks to, to form a government after the results. And that's really far too little. If we look internationally, they have months. We do have some municipalities where coalitions have worked, right? Prince Albert, uh, Mossel Bay and so on. But Pumala, this time around, will the ANC uh, get into coalitions if need be and govern with maturity and a focus on the people? What have you learned from your experiments with this? where we had uh, uh, engaged in a coalition, it's always uh, been uh, with a measure of uh, uh, maturity and appreciation that uh, we've got to act in the interest uh, of uh, the electorate. Uh, but certainly uh, it is quite true that uh, the maturity of the political system in the country doesn't yet uh, make it such an easy thing to do. Uh, for instance, uh, the DA's experience has really been uh, uh, quite uh, shambolic. Uh, we had more than four mayors in Job, uh, 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 together, that, uh, where it's really not been uh, working out uh, very well. So, yes, the ANC will seek to enter into a coalition, but a coalition for progress with parties that uh, uh, share largely uh, the, the common interests, so to speak, uh, on behalf of the people. I say this knowing very well that uh, the party political system still represents very stark, uh, uh, diverse uh, interests in, in society. Uh, so it's very difficult for those uh, to simply just mingle uh, uh, with that amount of ease. It is a challenge indeed. UDM, you see yourself as a kingmaker and you have been a kingmaker in some municipalities. A coalition built on keeping someone out. And I would say keeping the ANC out in Johannesburg in 2016, keeping the ANC out in Nelson Mandela Bay, out in Tswani. It didn't work. Have you learned anything? In coalition, the only problem that we've experienced as the UTM, especially under the late uh, Mayor Bobani, is that big parties, they, they've got the tendency of wanting to bully the small parties. Are you accusing the DA of, of trying to bully you? It happened with, uh, with, uh, with Trollip. One of the reasons why we are still working with the with with, with the DA is because uh, currently the current mayor, uh, Mr. Mbanga, is actually working very well with the UTM. That's why we are actually working with the DA. So in every chance that we get to actually do a coalition with any party, we'll take it for the sake of trying to deliver the services to the people. Let me give Gwen right of reply around being a coalition partner, but you're bigger than your partner. So you think that your voice should uh, and authority should be louder than theirs? 
Yeah, I think it needs to be a fair conversation because you are still partners. But I do think we have to remember the constitutional mandate for essentially that our electoral system is one based on, on proportionality. And I do think it's fair for the residents of any region that the party with the proportionally more votes does have weight proportional to its share of the vote. Do you say that upfront when you approach them for a coalition? I think it should be said. That's fair to say 40% of the voters in this area voted for us, 2% voted for you, and we must treat you with respect and we must negotiate and discuss as partners. But it can never be that we must you know, ignore the fact that 40% of the voters gave us their mandate. So who are you going to vote for and why? We find out when we return. Stay with us. Welcome back to the big debate on local government elections. Are you inspired to vote on November 1st? I really want to hear from our audience. Okay, Christopher, let's start with you. The question is, which party am I going to vote for? Um, the obvious choice is the DA. As uh, the DA representative has pointed out, um, the stats are clear on that uh, issue. The DA is quite good on service delivery. The DA provides uh, more to indigent uh, households than uh, most other parties. A lot of people like to point out the Kailicha issue in Cape Town. I feel like when you look at that issue, you need to look at also another DA municipality, Midvale. Midvale is one of the best run uh, municipalities in the country. Politicians can't, can't be trusted. The last elections I voted for EFF and they went to bed with the DA and they never consulted us with, with anything. And then now we're struggling here in Sushangubo with bills uh, that are abnormal. My mom is, is earning a grant of 1,800. How do you charge that person 800 for water bill, 900 for, for electricity? It's, it's absurd. You've got all these uh, political parties, uh, they are telling us lies. My question to them is that I will vote for any political party that seeks to transform the lives of the people. But what is uh, the strategy that the government is planning to use? In, in order to deal with this matter of unemployment. If you still have 74.5% of youth unemployment in South Africa, thank you very much. The DA says that they, they, they've got depth in terms of leaders, but they had to recall Helen Zealy. So to me, that doesn't appear that as if they've got depth. So the ANC, people have been suffering with water for the last 27 years. That problem is still ongoing as we speak. So I, I don't understand why would you still see yourself as a choice for, for people on the ground. I will definitely vote for the, the ANC because DA does not have any regard for black people. You look now, even in KZN, they praise the people of Phoenix for killing the black people. In Midrand, there's an area where they name the streets after the animals because it's the African people who are living in that street. I will vote for the ANC because they had a clean audit in Ekuruleni and other municipalities, and they've given 100 million basaris in Ekuruleni and 50 million basaris in Etequini. In Ward 112 in Midrand, the, the ward has always been under DA, but nothing has improved and there are no community meetings. So DA has failed the communities of Ward 112 in Midrand. And now the DA is saying for not servicing black communities, we should refer that to Mashaba. I am heartbroken and um, heavily laid a burden by the fact that young people think that not voting would um, actually be the, the right thing to do. In an actual fact, it is not. You are actually telling the government, continue looting, continue without any service delivery. And I want to call on all young people to take a stand and be the change that they want to be and vote for the youth. Um, we are putting people first, and we have been doing that for the past 20, 24 years uh, we've been in, in existence. We have been fighting uh, corruption. We are being enabled by uh, the state of disaster to have thugs like Becky Chele uh, continue on as minister. Okay, of police. you are talking about the police minister and you, you, you're calling him a thug. What would be the basis of that? Well, look at how he uh, bullied people on the beaches last year with the special task force. He was intimidating women and children on Clifton Beach. You follow that up with his behavior around legal licensed uh, film sets where he went and shut them down. 
his behavior and those kind of circumstances show the, the man that he is. And then yesterday he wasted taxpayers' money at the Zimbizo providing a stage and seating for 1,500 people where less than 100 people arrive and he wants to blame serious crimes on potholes. It, it, you know, the state of disaster has to come to an end and we have to really look at who the ANC is putting forward and upholding as their political leaders. What Francis has just done is to demonstrate the attitude of the, the DA. I'll be voting for the ANC because we believe in a united South Africa. We don't believe in divide and rule. What Francis demonstrated is like, you know, subtle racism. Uh, but is this uh, not consistent with the DA? It is. Because in every campaign that the DA has run, from fight black, fight back, uh, uh, Helen Zilla calling um, uh, Africans refugees, to the latest um, case in Phoenix, is a demonstration of uh, a very deep rooted racism in the DNA of the, of the DA. So people should vote for a party, the ANC, that is uniting all South Africans, not dividing us and uh, creating um, divisions among the color, the Indians, the Africans, and the, and, and the white people of this country. I'm a black person, and in my uh, experience, um, I've already been MC for Nelson Mandela, and I supported them originally. But you know, I attended the uh, DA Congress. It was the only party that I could see was non-racial. It represented the full spectrum and rainbow nation of South Africa. Everybody was there. Then in the Western Cape, really, 67% of the budget is spent in the marginal areas. Kayalicha, Langa, Nyanga, and Guguletu. Where there's no service delivery is because of the ANC councillors there. Then I want to say after 27 years of ANC rule, we saw in the Zondo Commission the state capture, the looting. Mandela must be turning in his grave, not turning maybe, spinning in his grave, uh, uh, really. Droves of South Africans, they're all coming to the Western Cape, uh, really, because of a better future and because of service delivery, and the DA gets things done. All right, that's Mark. Thank you very much. All the parties are promising heaven and earth and defending their record in areas where they have governed. Dare we trust them to make good on their promise? When we return, we hear the final words from our panel. Welcome back to the big debate on local government elections. Stats SA has found that 75% of households in South Africa do not believe that municipalities are actively addressing the issues they felt were most important for them. Whilst the Auditor General reported 26 billion rand in irregular expenditure in the 2019-2020 municipal audit outcomes. Now, can we trust the politicians to put our needs first as a belief? Let's hear last word from our panel. Let's start with you, Tessa. Final thoughts. Yeah, I'd like to put out a challenge to any party contesting. If you're going to run these local government elections as a proxy for national politics, then we're going to be failing the people of South Africa. And so we need to have politics that are local, that address the needs of every local community, where people are trusted and people can be held directly accountable. I think we're going to see an interesting turn with more independence, smaller parties that are emerging, because the people of South Africa are tired of being caught up in the party's big political battles, but not having their interests and their communities put first. This is the time to show that communities matter. You don't just touch base with communities when you need their vote, but you live in those communities and those communities matter. Andile, your final thoughts. As the UDM, one thing that we need to prioritize is the housing, because if you speak about water and electricity, where are you, where are you going to put that if you don't prioritize housing? And also the role of the traditional leaders in the rural areas, that's very important because the traditional leaders, they serve as the communication tool between government and people because government is very much detached from, from rural people. And also improve the health system, the local health system that we have at the clinics. The COVID has proven that uh, our health system is very weak. So we've learned a lot as the UTM. Uh, and also I'm anticipating a lot of coalition uh, due to the fact that there's a lot of independent candidates. As the UDM will work with everyone who seeks to deliver the services, you know, as agreed upon. So as the UDM, that's what we are bringing at the fore. And ethical government, of course, you know, in as far as getting rid of the corruption. All Thank right, Gwen, much. final thoughts from you. There is a lot of noise, admittedly, during an election. So to kind of 
go above that noise, I would suggest that every voter needs to look at independent or third party sources. So if you want to find out which party in the municipalities that it governs has a better track record on managing the finances prudently, you can look at Auditor General reports. If you want to know which party is a better performance delivery record, you can look at things like the state of local government program. Uh, you can also look at Good Governance Africa's report on, on the performance of, of the municipalities. So there are independent sources you can go to. Don't take my word for it. Look at what third parties are saying about how the DA governs. The second point I would make is that think about the things that do concern you about the DA, because I don't want to dismiss them. But think about whether that issue, whether it's a poster, whether it's what somebody said, does it determine whether you're, you have access to water, whether your electricity is running, whether your local councillor or council is not going to misuse your resources? That is what local government is about, and that is what should be driving your voting decision. Whatever you're concerned with, does it translate to a change in service delivery? And if it isn't, then I would beg that that is not an issue that should be driving voting behavior in this election. Final thoughts, ANC representative Pumolo. I would also just urge uh, the people of the country uh, to, on the 1st of November, have the courage to go out and vote and vote for the African National Congress for a number of reasons. We're just about the only political party that has placed its candidate before the scrutiny of the community in the ward where that candidate comes from. Having exhausted internal processes, we took those candidates to the community meetings for the community to endorse if agreed, but were not agreed to change. And we've got candidates that are themselves a reflection of the community choice. And we think that that should go a long way in taking on board the aspirations of the people and not of the party. Basic services like water, electricity, refuse collection have suffered under the weight of corruption, inefficiency and nepotism. We have seen children cross rivers to get to school because someone didn't build a road. Sewage runs down people's homes, potholes and shacks are on the increase. There seems to be very little regard for the dignity of the poor. With just two weeks left, who has the best plan to change things around? You decide. Remember, the local government election is on the 1st of November. I'm Ridi Kabi. You've been watching The Big Debate.